So joining me on the fretboard atlas this week is one of my favourite guitar players. Many of you on this channel, I am sure, know his name and are well familiar with his work already. And I was very, very keen to interview him uh, when I started this channel because I know that not only is he a great player and a nice guy, but he's also got a wealth of musical knowledge. He won Australia's Got Talent. He has a True Fire channel called Guitar Synergy, and I'm delighted to have him on the fretboard atlas. Joe Robinson, thanks so much for joining me. G'day, Shane. It's my pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, well, I've, I have an awful lot of stuff I want to ask you about, um, but where I thought we might start talking first, um, because I know that we kind of have this in common in our background. Um, but I know you grew up in Australia and you had a mix of different influences on the guitar. I grew up in Ireland with mainly Irish traditional music. Mm -hmm. But James Taylor was a big influence on both of us. And I was just wondering what insight or what kind of foundation did that lay for you? Because I'm interested to hear how it, how it compares up to my own. It was very interesting because I, I always loved James's songs. And, you know, I remember before I even played the guitar, my parents would, would be playing music around the house with their friends, and I grew up in that kind of environment. And they'd be playing Fire, Fire and Rain and Something in the Way She Moves and all those great songs. Oh, so, yeah. so I always loved the songs. But uh, when I started to want to sing and play, you know, I was playing a lot of solo guitar concerts, and I found that, you know, if I'm just playing on stage for a 90 minute show, I, f I feel like I was ripping people off if I didn't sing a song, <laughs> especially in, <laughs> in, in Australia where it's kind of like, all right, well, we've seen you like, you know, trick with all the fast notes, like sing a song now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I started to sing more and I found that James Taylor's songs were the most helpful songs to learn because they have great mel melodic vocal parts with great phrasing and the guitar parts are just so gorgeous <clears throat> and uh i happen to have my, my my guitar here and like i learned every song in the james taylor greatest hits songbook and <laughs> so did i <laughs> yeah you know, you just played yeah. played along with all those songs like mexico yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many great songs, so many great grooves. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of... I, I really like the kind of mid-tempo, R&B-influenced mm. acoustic vibes. You know, that that's always been just mm. something... It's like kind of a sweet uh, way to play the acoustic guitar. So, so that's how... Mm -hmm. As well as, you know, the other musicians that, that played on his record records are so great. And, you know, mm. gr growing up, I, I kind of got into the real musicians behind the scenes and became yeah. a fan of Steve Gadd and, uh, and you know, J Jimmy Johnson, Lee Sklar and all the, Russ Dunkel, all the great musicians that, that, that worked with him. And so I enjoyed kind of dissecting the records. And, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. he, he's just such a classy musician. And there's certain people like mm. James Taylor and Sting and Stevie Wonder and Elton John. And, I mean, there's just some some really incredible music that came out of the late 60s and 70s yeah so, and tell it. me was was james taylor your initial kind of influence to pick up the guitar or were there musicians before him as well yeah but i say the initial influence was eric clapton mm. i remember hearing uh layla on the um I remember I had this vi vivid moment of being, you know, probably n eight or nine years old and jumping on the trampoline outside as you did as a kid. Mm. And, you know, my parents had this limited cassette tape collection, but they had mm. a R Rory Gallagher album, Ry Cooter, yes. Van, Van Morrison, there's some Irish music, um, yeah. and, uh, and The Cream of Clapton. And the first track was... Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I just remember playing air guitar on the trampoline, jumping up and down, thinking, oh man, one day I want to be able to do that. And uh, mm. that's the earliest seed I remember, you know, that seed planted of like, okay, I want, I want to learn how to play the guitar. And so, yeah, Eric, Eric mm. Clapton was a real big influence early on. And I learned the songs in the Eric Clapton Unplugged songbook to Tears in Heaven. And I, my first album I recorded. Oh, yeah. I can't remember how to play it now, but Sinye, I think it's called. Mm. And um, 
yeah so that that was kind of the the first influence to to, to play the guitar i found james taylor a, a little later on mm-hmm. and th- well it's 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 interesting you say both of those names because i think that most people listening would agree that you can still hear an awful lot of those influences in your playing now and that it, it's kind of informed what the the foundation was kind of for you to build upon because you've gone in so many directions like i remember um, it, when I was in school, uh, I think I, I, don't, I think I was in secondary school at the time, and you came on YouTube for the first time, and I and I it was wow. that series of videos. There was like a, a blue wall in the background. Your hair uh-huh. was longer. You were playing an eight oh eight, and you were playing all you were playing mostly your own compositions, for what I remember. But I just remember staring at the screen, going, "Oh my god, he's like he's two years older than I am, and he's doing all this amazing stuff. How how has he learned this stuff this quickly?" Um, but it's amazing to see how, uh, you know, the, 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 as I said, the foundation you had in those great guitar players kind of has informed what you do now. Because obviously both of us came across Tommy Emmanuel and the ilk of fingerstyle music that exists out there as well. But I know that Tommy's brother Phil uh, was a huge influence and a mentor to you as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the way I came to... Uh, no fingerstyle guitar and fall in love with fingerstyle guitar was first my parents have had some musical friends who played you know they had John Knowles's heavy necking book that like that there was one copy of that book that the whole community shared <laughs> <laughs> and like there's all these you know guys and most of them were farmers you know they have you know they you know have a you know, a, a lot of cattle, and they'd be managing their cattle, and then they'd get together, you know, every few weeks and, and have yeah. a big, a, a, a long weekend of, of drinking and partying and playing mm. finger style guitar. And they'd sit around and play all those Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed songs and Doc wow. Watson and Mel Travis. And, um, and my parents took, took me to one of those sessions one time because my parents, you, you know, like to hang out at the, those kind of uh, <laughs> shindigs. And mm. uh, yeah, a fellow showed me how to play kind of like a fingerstyle blues that was the first thing I learned and then freight train windy and warm and pretty soon mm. I learned Mr. Lucky by Jerry Reed oh yeah and that, that was a real challenge. Like, I remember just sitting there for hours trying to figure that out. But once I figured it out, I couldn't stop playing it. I loved the walking bass, and I loved that yeah. whole thing. And so when I got the chance to meet Phil Emanuel, I played him that. And he's like, he, he said to me, I've said this in interviews before, but he said, he said, Joe, most 11-year-olds are playing some Limp biscuit crap, or, you know, they're listening to some <laughs> crappy music. And you, you can play, like, Cliffs of Dover and... And uh, Mr. Lucky by Jerry Reed. So Phil became someone who really encouraged me and just made me kind of realize, wow, like not everyone's like me playing all these songs. And, and, mm. and you know, and he told me about so much great music. He turned me on to Steve Morse and the Helicasters and, mm. and um, you know, really, really became a great friend and mentor. And I got the opportunity to tour with him. And, uh, and that was just really changed my life. But hearing Tommy play was just like, Oh my goodness. It, it was kind of like I was playing with a band at the time and I couldn't mm-hmm. get the other band members to be as passionate as me about practicing. <laughs> you know, no one was into it as much as me. But when I saw Tommy, I was like, man, he doesn't even need a band. He can do it with, <laughs> with, without a- anyone. And it's, and it's powerful. And like, I'm watching this huge theater full of people. This is the nicest building I've ever been in, this theater. Like, I was like... Mm. There's some, something, something about this that I have to figure out how he's doing that. So from there I became, mm. and I got the chance to, to, to meet Tommy and, uh, you know, I definitely knew Phil a lot better, you know, real early on. And, um, mm-hmm. and Phil became a, a good family friend. Uh, my mom, you know, was working as a vet, veterinary nurse and, mm. uh, and she had, you know, access to these huge freezers and Phil, Phil would uh, organize, he, Phil had pythons like in, in his house there'd be like 50 pythons and uh, I, I I took my, my band to his house one time to two African American guys from Memphis and they were just like <laughs> glued to the walls like where are you taking us Joe this guy's like crocodile Dundee or something but Phil used to talk, call my mom and say hey Kath I need some frozen rats can you you know 
um, put some in the freezer for me. And so mum <laughs> would t- take like a cooler full of frozen rats to, f- to fill his gig. And, Whoa. And he'd be like, oh, thanks so much, Kath. And we became, you know, he... We, we became re- really good family friends. He's he's a real character, and well, he he was a really character and a real special guy, and and uh, mm. and just as passionate about animals as uh, as he was about music, and mm-hmm. um, so so a- anyway, that that was kind of how it all s- started for me. And um, mm. I remember when I first heard Tommy play Blue Moon. You know, I mm. I got kind of the greatest hits Tommy Emanuel CD at you know like the local CD shop or whatever. And I heard Blue Moon, and just the way that recording sounded, and the groove, and the rhythm, the mm. swing elements, the whole, everything about it was just like that is so impossibly good. And I still mm. listen to that recording and just am like, wow, that's that's like, I don't know how how they got that sound. Or, I mean, it just feels. Oh yeah, I, 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 feels I remember so to give you a kind of a little anecdote about that. I remember I was on a plane journey across Lake Michigan uh, two years ago now, and uh, I remember I I think I turned on. I hadn't listened to Tommy's music for a long time, and I put on Endless Road, the whole album, yeah. and I didn't even realize that we'd landed. I was just so stuck in it, and eventually the, the stewardess <laughs> kind of comes over and is like. Excuse, sir, sir, sir. But you know, it, and I, I, I know you've definitely had those moments as well where you just got lost in listening to something that you love. What I'm curious to know is, outside of, say, kind of um, musicians who, like, play the guitar as their main instrument, who else would you count as some, like, a musician or a group that has had a big influence on how you approach music? Um, well, there's been a huge number of, of players, uh, Eric Johnson, mm. Robin Ford, in terms of electric mm. players with a lot of fluidity and just musicality and, you know, I mean, virtuosity. Uh, mm. People like Steve Morse and John Petrucci, as far as te- straight up technique goes. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Joe Pass, I mean, there's just so so many players. Eric Clapton for just the vibe and the kind of... Eric Clapton and Mark Knopfler for the vibe and the kind of stoic, you know, uh, guy who plays guitar vibe. <laughs> you know, I always, <laughs> I always uh, appreciated them for that. Um, mm-hmm. But there, there, there have been so many people that have, that have become mentors to me. Like lately, Rodney Crowell. And remember, you, you, you came to see see a, our show in, uh, it was in Dublin. Oh, the show in Dublin. Yeah, I remember coming yeah. up to that. Yeah, playing with Rodney Crow has really been a, you know, transformative uh, experience in terms of learning about songwriting. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, there's there's been a number of people who've been hugely in, in, influential. I, I I feel like I understand the language of music through through studying Tommy Emanuel's songs, and I'm sure you relate to that. And mm. uh, and I feel like I understand songwriting from hanging with Rodney and. And understand the blues from hanging with Robin, and mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean, every every good thing in my musical journey has been because of a mentor. You know, whether I was mm-hmm. able to meet them in person, or whether I just listened to them and learned their songs, or watched their videos, or just soaked in the mm-hmm. inspiration, or read a book. But, but as I, as I said uh, just a, a little bit earlier on, uh, you can definitely tell that you have this kind of wealth of musical knowledge. Like I remember, for instance. Um, when I was in Nashville, I think it must have, I can't remember if it was July or September, but yourself and Sean De La Croce had an album launch in mm-hmm. Franklin. I think it was at the Franklin Theatre. Yeah. And I didn't think I was going to make the gig because I was going to be flying home and my flight got cancelled and I was able to come to the theatre that night. And, and I was, I think I was directly in front of you in, <laughs> yeah. in the first row that night. I remember that. Um, but what stood out to me, because I'd actually never seen one of your stage shows before. And what stood out to me that night was just that a your technique is scary, and b your the, the way that you're able to move between you know the the kind of the solo finger style stuff, the more singer songwriter stuff, the more bluesy stuff where you dig in. Um, it's it's really really fluid, and that only comes I suppose from you know the years that you have of touring, gigging, working with people, all that kind of um, 
that information you've taken in. If you're enjoying this interview, make sure to click on the link in the description to check out the Fretboard Atlas on Truefire. You'll find lots more interviews with some of my favourite musicians from a variety of musical styles, and you'll get an insight into what has helped them the most on their musical journeys. You'll also have access to my own lessons covering everything from beginning to finger pick on the guitar to playing the most complex techniques. Each month we'll focus on new tunes and new material with the aim of reaching your musical goals. To see some free lessons and for all of the information, make sure to check out the Fretboard Atlas on Truefire. And now back to the interview. One thing that I'm big about on the Fretboard Atlas, because it's the approach I come from, is that my music theory and my understanding of that sort of side of music is still not as good as it could be. It's definitely better than it was, but it's not great. What I'm interested to know is how much has understanding that side of music been a help to you? Are you one of those guys who has kind of done everything by ear and figured it out by feel? Or have you ended up using little bits and pieces of theory and kind of the more academic side of it along the way? Well, in high school, I had a really great music teacher. Mm. And I, I didn't last very long in high school. I left when I was pretty early. But I had a really great music teacher who was a, a London conservatorium trained musician, which in my small town, mm. that was really special to mm. have to have him play Rachmaninoff to us in the classroom and things like that. Oh, wow. Pre pretty incredible. But I, t I took music theory grades. So ah, okay. I, I have really... I don't have formal training in terms of guitar technique or anything like that, but I did formal music theory grades. And mm. I think I got to like grade eight or something. And, uh, and I forget most of it. However, I feel like I learned some really important, you know, ideas about harmony and just having that background really helped me understand jazz a little bit. I, f I feel like, I mean, there are people who understand jazz on a, on a much deeper level, level than me. But I have a few great books here that, that I've studied a lot. There's a guitarist in Australia named Jim Kelly, who's one of the kind of premier jazz guitar instructors. And he has a book mm. called The Dominant Seventh Chord and Then the Blues. And I've, mm. I've just devoured that ever since I was a, t a teenager. And uh, yeah, I mean, any, anywhere to get the information, I was kind of hu hungry for it. However, I feel like I've always just used that information to serve me being able to create songs. And, yeah. you know, it's like I still to this day, if I'm doing a cover or something, I just want to change stuff up so much. And sometimes people <laughs> yeah. will say, oh, that was really great, but that's not a cover. Like, you got to play it the way <laughs> the way we know it. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, well, that's just not really built into my, you know, way of um, approaching music. I love stealing bits and pieces from everywhere to make my own songs. That's really the end game yeah. for, yeah. for me. So everything was in service of that. But I, I feel like all the experience, um, you know, whether it's playing in rock bands, blues bands, country bands, uh, playing solo. Sorry, getting a phone call. Oh, it, sorry. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Should, 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 <laughs> saved by the bell. I was ho hoping it was my mum calling from Australia. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, all, all that has, you know, really helped my musicality. I remember I, I was sitting with Tommy one time, and we're actually on stage at one of his guitar camps, and I and I asked him, I said, "How much has being a drummer influenced the way you play guitar?" Because to me, his rhythmic pocket is just everything, and that's the. Mm. That's like the the magic, the secret sauce that sets, you know, someone really apart is 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 the time, and the mm -hmm. tone and the touch and all, and all that. And and Chet was so great, and Tommy, um, mm -hmm. his immaculate sense of groove, and he said absolutely, it it really, influenced the the way I play. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it all, you know, helps you become a a, a well rounded musician. That's that's my take on. On things mm -hmm. anyway, and and something interesting you said there about how time and touch are so important, uh, particularly as as guitar players, but for all musicians. But something that's always stood out to me about your playing in particular, whether you're playing acoustic or electric, is that I can identify you almost straight away. You have a Joe Robinson sound, and you could be playing on someone's CD or you could be playing solo, and I could be blindfolded and I'd still go, "That's a hun that's definitely Joe Robinson. I know by his touch." So I suppose Thanks, my mate. question is, because I know this will be beneficial for the, the people watching on the channel, 
if somebody is looking to improve their touch on the guitar, what would your top recommendations be to do some, to, to improve their touch on their instrument? Uh, well, one thing is to get your vibrato to really be smooth and controlled. That's something that I think I don't hear a lot of people talk about. But having, you know, on an electric guitar, it's, it's really important. But on an acoustic mm. as well. And I, th I think it, it all kind of, you know, is part of the same thing. But mm. I used to play a D for an hour. <laughs> this is an idea I got from oh. a, a Steve Vai article. And you'd play this D and you'd work on every different way you could, you know, shake it and getting really used to just pulling all the beauty out of one note. Mm. And people might be surprised to hear that because they'll listen to me play and they'll be like, oh, he just plays 10,000 notes at once. But mm. if you can really learn to have a sweet vibrato, I think that's such a huge part of pulling a good sound out of the instrument. Another thing mm. is having really good dynamics. One thing I suggest, well, one thing I like to practice is um, playing a song as loudly as you can you know, putting earplugs in even and just having it be this brash, horrible sound, mm. but trying to get the left hand to be as, as relaxed and light as possible. Mm. And then playing as softly as you can, just whisper quiet, but trying to have every note be clear and clean. Mm. And then, you know, working on kind of having this dynamic element to your playing where you can lean into certain melody notes and lean into certain bass notes and just have mm -hmm. it really breathe and be very legato and and uh you know i think that's to me an important part of the way i like to uh, uh, approach it um mm. also it comes from from just listening and really paying attention you know mm -hmm. I, I i think i have a little bit of a uh you know i, I can be a bit ocd and if if something's a little bit off it can really throw throw me. Um, I've been in the okay. studio with people, and I've been like, "Oh, just turn it down a tiny bit. Turn turn this instrument down a tiny bit." And they've been like, "No, you can't possibly hear that point three of a dB, Joe." And I'm like, "I can hear it. <laughs> I can totally hear it." <laughs> um, so I think just 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 being quite, just trying trying to listen, but at the same time, you know, when when you're playing, you just want to you just want to be thinking about the sound and the tone and the feeling and the and the the, the music and and um, mm. and uh, yeah, I, I I think the touch is just such a. I've I've really always been attracted to touch players. You know, Chet and Mark mm. Knopfler and Ry Cooter and Tommy and mm. you know these players just have such a beautiful tone with their with their hands and mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's part of the magic to me. And another thing that I wanted to ask you about as well, because it's something I'm focusing on a, a lot on the channel as well, is that. And I know I've seen you do this from from when you started, um, or when you started appearing online, I should say, but I'm uh, undoubtedly before it, is that it seems like you had a very good ability to improvise from, you know, a much younger age than what I would say is normal of a most guitar players. So, for example, I know kind of in, in at least in the Irish trad world, nobody improvises. Improvisation really? is just not a part of Irish music. It's all fixed. The only improv you get is in the accompaniment. That's Whereas, so fascinating say, in the to blues, me. In the blues and jazz world, it's all improv. There's so much improv over everything. So I'm curious to know where that came from and how it has developed over the years. When I was like, my, my first gig ever was with this country singer named Texas Rose. And she kind of had a, like a Janis Joplin type vibe. Like she was, she was, she was a belter. <laughs> And yeah. um, and we played these bars that were just jam packed full of. We played like biker bars, like with bikies, you know. We call them bikies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Street. Like rough places, and um, the kind of gig where you get your own bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, well, there were yeah. there were fights all the time. Sometimes mm. with the other members of the, the band, like <laughs> one, one of them had a, a punching fight with a police officer for giving him a parking ticket. Like this, this is, I'm sure, like, yeah. you know, I know people in Irish like to have a punch up as well. <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you, I've played plenty of gigs, like particularly when I was in college. I mean, I used to do gigs around town for money and it was, it was sometimes, depending on where you were playing, it was the same kind of thing. You know, because not only have the locals, but you have all the tourists coming in as well. And they, they don't realize that, you know, three pints of Guinness is enough to, to send you for the day. Right. You know, so, yeah, we, I saw a couple of hairy scenes as well. Yeah. Well, so you were saying anyway about this, this uh, Texas Rose. Yeah. And so she had a repertoire of a thousand songs. That was, you know, she'd be like, I know a thousand oh. songs and I have them all in a, in a binder. 
And when you're on stage with me, Joe, I'm going to play whatever I want. So you got to just follow follow along. Wow. And the thing with playing country music is if you play a wrong note, it just sounds like crap. <laughs> you can instantly tell. So I was like the 12-year-old guitar player with a Strat and a little Fender Deluxe amp. <laughs> yeah. And we were playing these rough joints and she'd look at me to, to take a solo and I'd have to like, you know... Uh, kind of play something convincing and I and it was a real learning experience and she was so kind uh-huh. to me because you know she just really encouraged me and and uh, and featured me a lot in in the show and uh, it just it was just really a great way to to get more comfortable improvising and learning how to hear where the chord changes are going and so and also mm-hmm. you know when I played in my first band we were a kind of psychedelic rock band and all I wanted to do was play 20 minute guitar solos <laughs> that was my whole thing. I, I loved it when a keyboard player would play keyboards because he also played a little bit of saxophone. I'd be like, no, just play those pad chords so I can solo over the top. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was I was always into that. I, I think I always, I just like to show off. And when I when I would do a guitar solo, it was my chance to get up there and, and you know, no, no, noodle away. But, but I, I suppose um, the thing that stands out to me there is that most um, guitar players and musicians in general that I know when they are part of a band, they don't get that much opportunity as you had in those shows to actually get out and improvise and to just be like called on the fly to say, you don't know the song, but you're you're soloing over these changes and you better yeah. learn to deal with it. Um, well, well, I, 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 I imagine that in the same way that is, I don't know if you feel this, but I know when I go out on stage and I play something new, it's like you have to get it wrong a couple of times before you start getting it right. So I wonder, is it the same kind of idea? Yeah, well... It, it 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 is, um, and you know it, it's what, why when I first came to America, I loved playing with with church musicians, with musics from the the black church mm. community, because because they grow up, you know, five years old playing drums in a church, and it's like it's totally yeah. improvised. Everything is you know just moving in the chords, and it's like you're just expected to to hear where it goes. There's kind of a language, mm. and uh, and uh, yeah, I I've always. In, enjoyed that you know it's the informal nature of of just uh of just j- jamming away so a question i had from uh one of the subscribers on the channel um alex from russia and he asked me uh, specifically for you um what routines or approaches have you taken over the years to improvise particularly in jazz soloing so i i assume that question would mean like the kind of the more outside stuff that you play the kind of the, you know getting away from your kind of basic pentatonics and that kind of thing because i know that you've also made a couple of true fire courses about this kind of stuff yeah yeah i have a true fire course called 10 scales and modes you must know and i've i found the modes to be really useful uh mm. you know learning and getting comfortable with the mixolydian mode the dorian mode especially as well as just understanding you know the natural minor scale and the major scale all over the fingerboard mm. so to me the, the way i learned and the way i think is a great approach is to learn like the c major scale all over the neck you know and then you know that happens to feature the same notes as the a natural minor scale so mm. you can practice playing in C major with all those notes, and then you can practice playing in A minor with all those notes. Yeah. And that those are also the same notes as the G mixolydian mode. So just mm. having kind of that information is helpful. And uh, and finding a few good jazz standards t- to learn. You know, there's a mm. number of really cool songs with some great twists and turns, like Blue Bosser is a really great one. matter of finding a few good songs like that and practicing playing over the changes using those scales and modes and there's a few little really cool kind of twists and turns using scales like the melodic minor and the harmonic minor the Mm. harmonic minor is really great for kind of gypsy swing I use that a lot The melodic minor can be can be really useful. Like if you play a flat melodic minor over a G7 chord, mm. you get this sound. Oh. 
Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was practicing that this morning actually and another yeah. and that that kind of only works if the g7 is resolving to a c minor mm. so if it's kind of like a you know a five chord going to a you know the the, the one chord mm. that that really works and another way to use the melodic minor is if you're playing kind of like a dominant seventh chord like a two five one type thing uh -huh. over the e7 you can play b melodic minor mm. which sounds like this Over the, huh, so, yeah. if, so if we played, I was practicing this this morning, if we played Sweet Georgia Brown, mm. if we played like E7, you can play B, B melodic minor. Over A7, you can play E melodic minor. <laughs> over, over the D7, you can play A melodic minor. <laughs> and so, j there's just a few little... Kind of, you know, I, I I call it like cowboy jazz. It's kind of like ways of of mm -hmm. uh, bringing in some of those, you know, h harmonic ideas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the way I like to practice the scale, you know, is just kind of like playing the scale and getting real used to the scale, and then playing mm -hmm. it in thirds. So for like the C major scale, you play it in thirds. Mm -hmm. And the most to me the most amazing thing about the guitar is how our hands remember how to how to do how to do this mm, like yeah you have some really complicated songs i do too how we can just get on stage and play them without mm. using our brains too much really is yeah. totally incredible so if you can use that you know uh incredible part of the human mind to train your hands to really just remember those scales and remember mm -hmm. those patterns and pay attention to the sound because I think it's important not to just think of them as like you know it's a shape or a pattern it's a, it's mm -hmm. a sound and you know to use it in a musical context but yeah just play them over and over again again so comfortable with them that you can't play a wrong note that's yeah. what I, I think it takes and I think a lot of people give mm -hmm. up bef before that they get to that point you know whenever someone oh, hears yeah. me hears me practice it's just like oh my god i can't believe that's how you practice <laughs> you just sit there playing the same thing for like hours mm. that's that's the only way i know how to do it yeah yeah but you can tell as well when you play because i mean every every even all the stuff you just played from there was so fluid and there's there's no there's no way to fake that you know you did the only way you get there is by putting in that time and committing it so solidly to muscle memory that you don't have to think about that side of it anymore you can think about where you're going next which is yeah. which is it's, it's like the, that's the goal for most people but you explained it really well there about the kind of the path you took to get there as well yeah. um i was wondering as well as you're talking about that because I've, I've been asking everybody that has come onto the channel so far this question uh, everyone has one of these at some point but um, in terms of light bulb moments, so in terms of a moment that you've had as a musician where something that hadn't been making sense or something that was like inaccessible to you all of a sudden made it like it clicked or it just made sense, have you had any moments like that as a musician? Well, I'm, I mean, there's there's been a handful of light bulb moments in a, in, a ter in terms of oh wow, that's that's deeper than I thought it was, or I didn't realize that was something I ought to be focusing on. Like when I first sat with Tommy, he said, Joe, you need to work on your timing. He's like, you got to get better time. So when he said that, it was like I traveled all the way to Nashville to meet my hero. And he just kind of laid it down and was like totally honest and real with me. And I was just like kind of mm. crushed, but also like, OK, well, yeah, he's he's uh, in a position to give me some really good advice. So it's mm -hmm. probably some, something to it. I remember the first time I was in the recording studio, and I, I encourage every guitar player to ha to go into the studio and have some experience recording, even just listening back to yourself, you know, recorded on a smartphone or whatnot. Mm. But uh, the first time I went in the studio was just like, oh my goodness, I don't sound anywhere near as good as I, th I, th I thought I was. <laughs> so that 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 was kind of a a, a real awakening. Um, yeah, there there have been a handful of. You know, we were just talking about scales, a handful of like guitar licks and things that inspired me. There's a mm -hmm. guitarist named Ray Flack, who was a Nashville guitarist, 
back back in the you know uh, 80s and 90s. He's actually from England, but he played with Emmylou mm-hmm. Harris and a lot of people. And he mm-hmm. has this he had this starlit set of uh, instructional videos, and he had this one lick. And I remember just being like, all I could play at that time was the pentatonic scale. And I was like, oh, you can kind of just play it up and down the neck instead of just kind of, you know, you can play across the fingerboard instead of, instead of just up and down. And so learning that, I remember taking that to different keys and just kind of finding different ways to play it. And he had another lick. And I was like, okay, so that was the first time I was exposed to double stops. Mm-hmm. And I always loved the sound of double stops. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's been something, those are just a couple of little devices that have mm-hmm. been really useful in, 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 in my music. You know, using mm-hmm. double stops, playing scales with double stops. as well as playing up and down the neck like on one string I'm just playing the G major scale there so mm-hmm. th- those were a, a couple of, of light bulb moments mm-hmm. um, yeah with with like songwriting I remember we're talking with Rodney Crowell about about rhyme structure and he does not tolerate soft rhymes it has to be a hard <laughs> right. rhyme and if you listen yeah. to Dylan or you listen to you know Leonard Cohen or Tom Waits or any of these guys it's hard rhymes <laughs> Hard rhymes. You know that yeah. they don't, they don't, they don't cheat, cheat, cheat on that side of things, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know Rodney's songwriting mentor was Guy Clark, and Rodney said, I asked Rodney, what, what are you thinking about when you're, you know, writing a song or delivering a song on stage, and he said, I just think I'm looking into Guy Clark's eyes because we used to do this exercise when we were songwriters. He said, he said we used to look in each other's eyes, and if we had a weak line, you know, we'd look in each other's eyes and recite the words to our song. And if we if we had a weak line, a ten, the tendency would be to look away. Wow! So I thought that was a really powerful idea, and, mm. uh, and it's something that that I think a lot about, you know. And when I get on stage, I try and look the eye, I try and look the audience right in the audience's eye. <laughs> I imagine it's one big eye, and I'm just kind of like trying to just give them all the joy and positivity and energy that I can muster. Wow! So. There's a few little light bulb moments for me. Well, that's that's really interesting to me because, um, you know, to, to me and and even seeing what you've done, you know, during this this time now where like none of us are touring, none of us are are performing live, or most of us aren't at the moment. Um, it, it seems to me like even as you were talking about the light bulb moments there, you take an idea, you practice it, and you're kind of you have a very natural curiosity in looking for other ways to manipulate it, as in taking this kind of core idea and then. To, you know, essentially taking it for all it's worth. And what has stood out to me, and this is the reason I brought in the, the thing about the pandemic, is that, um, and I know I said this to you a couple of weeks ago, but your work ethic is amazing in that, you know, I remember seeing a video before where you spoke about getting up at four in the morning to to, to practice and, you know, having a practice routine <laughs> and keeping practice journals. But on the flip side of that, a question that I got from one of the subscribers from Kazakhstan, a guy named Murat Zainula. I don't know if you've seen him on Instagram. He's a great guitar player. But he asked, um, what does Joe do when he's not inspired to play and write? Do, do you go through those periods? Well, just before I get to that question, the idea of the, the work ethic, I just want to talk about that a little bit. Because, mm. you know... Um, one of my my favorite kind of philosopher thinker people is is Nassim Taleb, and and he will say, I hate this idea of a Protestant work ethic. He he calls himself a, he 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 said I I'm a what do you do for a living? He said I flaneur, <laughs> you know I basically flaneur. He he's like I basically just hang out and just like think of things and write poetry and just philosophize in my mind, mm. and like. I don't think of the work ethic as being like this rigid, like disciplinary thing. Mm-hmm. I think of it as just cultivating good habits. And once you get a, a habit, all you got to do is just stick with the habit. It becomes mm-hmm. way easier. It's not like, you know, you wake up for, at 4 a.m. for the first time and it's just like hell. <laughs> and then it's like that every time. It's like 
you get used to it once you get used to going to bed at you know 8 9 p.m and mm. uh, it's the same with practicing like if i haven't practiced for a few months because i've been on tour or doing something different you know just maybe i've been in australia with my family i come back to practicing and i'm like mm-hmm. oh man it's just like i sit down for 30 minutes and that's about all the attention span i have but mm. the next day i can do an hour and then i can do two hours and mm. it's just like you just build the habit and it becomes so much easier so mm. i try and think of things as like what what is focus really and focus is really doing less so what what mm. kind of things can can i cut out i have my phone off pretty much all day <laughs> I just have it in airplane mode and that's something that just gives me, you know, I'm fortunate that I have, you know, there'll be a time when that that's not possible. Maybe I'll have kids or something, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'll need to be on call a little more. But, um, you know, just trying to make life as simple as possible so that you can Mm -hmm. build, build in time to, to, to practice. And when I'm practicing, I try and be really deliberate and really focused. But it's also a really creative experience, and it's just it's just joy and it's fun. And oftentimes, I practice standing up and walking around. And I mean, I pace. I mean, my backyard in Australia used to have pacing trails. <laughs> and uh, my my little brother Toby, you know, he used to pace all day, and and he he'd memorize movie scripts and and whatnot. And um, mm. and I used to walk around practicing guitar. So so the idea of just this work ethic being this rigid thing, I I, I think it's about focusing which is actually doing less yeah. and just kind of building good habits so that's that, that that that's what i think about it with regard to the question about what do you do when you're not inspired well i think you got to seek out inspiration and you got to know what inspires you mm. i know what inspires me i know what music inspires me i know what books inspire me i know what people inspire me and we live in an incredible time where these people are on call with the internet <laughs> Mm. You know, if, if, if I want to be inspired, you know, if I want to go out and spend a bunch of money on something I don't need to spend money on, I know people who are ins- inspire me to think a little more rationally about that. And I have my yeah. financial gurus. And then if I want to, you know, write a song that, that has a lot of heart and a lot of soul and, and you know, I, I, I have people that I'll listen to for inspiration. And, you know, I was listening to an interview with Tommy Emmanuel the other day and he was asked the same question, you know, what are you doing when you're not inspired? And he's like, oh, you got to, you can't put something out unless you take something in. That's a common, mm. you know, t- that's a phrase t- Tommy says a lot. He's like, if if the Beatles hadn't listened to Chuck Berry and all these people, you know, they couldn't have been the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, as musicians, we can't just always be putting out great stuff. We have to also soak in great music and study great music. Mm-hmm. So when thinking of when to be inspired it's like you've got to you've got to know yourself and know what inspires you and what connects with you and go and seek that out and and uh that's that's what's been most useful for me Mm -hmm. um i suppose uh, another thing that uh i'm curious about because uh it's something else we've got in common is that we're both um you know songwriters both of us are interested in composing not only instrumentals but also lyrically as well And something I'm curious to to ask you on a personal level is, do you find that there's a difference in either the process or the outcome when you're composing for a song or an instrumental, if that's what you have in mind? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm composing instrumentals again for the first time in years. Mm. Um, You know, I spent so long working on music for a particular album and, and, you know, working with songwriters here in Nashville and and writing lyrics and songs like that. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a different process? Well, I think it's a completely different process because, and you know, I'm kind of having, I'm at that kind of crossroads where it's like I, I find a really cool idea or a cool groove or, and I'm like, oh, okay, mm-hmm. do I turn this into an instrumental or do I put words to it? Yeah. And one thing I, I'm, I'm thinking of as just a side note is, you know, a lot of the great jazz records had you know, like there'd be these three minute songs and they just seem like one chorus and maybe one at the end. And then there'd be all this great mus- musicianship. And I really love that idea. The idea mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be this whole verse chorus, you know, blah, blah, blah type yeah. thing. <laughs> so um, I'm kind of interested in finding a, a middle ground there. But to, to, to me, when writing a song with lyrics, um, I've really come to appreciate starting from a title 
you know you listen to the the beatles you know they're like that cd with like 20 seats or 31 number one songs however many number ones they had like almost every song starts with the title of the song in either the chorus or the or the verse Mm -hmm. so it's like the title is just baked into the song and that's what it's all built around and you know a lot of the great standards are written that way and you know one of my songwriting mentors here in nashville brent mayer you know who's his mentors were Bootlow and Felice Bryant, who mm. wrote the songs for the Everly Brothers, and the Everly Brothers were, you know, huge influence on the Beatles. So this is kind of like, yeah. you know, got, got, going back to the the source here, and um, and Brent says, you know, he said I'll write with people, Joe, and they'll come to me and they have a whole song, but they don't know what it's called. And he's like, I think that's just totally. <laughs> It's tot- and, and it ha- happens a lot because it's like you get a good verse idea and you'll have a chorus and you'll have the melody mm. but it's like what's the song about so starting from a title I think you know you know I, I got this song idea and it's called this okay how do we b- build a song around that and mm-hmm. you know I was listening to an interview with Ed Sheeran the other day and he does the same thing and so I think that's the kind of way to, to write a lyric based song mm-hmm. with an instrumental you know it's kind of just like I've been reading about the great composers, about Haydn and Handel and Mozart and Beethoven mm-hmm. and Bach and all these people. And I mean, that's the world that instrument, like that's the greatest music, in- instrumental music that that we have mm-hmm. access to. <laughs> and yeah. so the way those melodies connect and mm-hmm. the atmosphere and the harmonies underneath, I mean, that's kind of where I'm drawing a lot of inspiration these days. Mm-hmm. Um, for in, in, instrumental music, but it's to me instrumental music. It's all about connecting, and it's and I love the way you you write. And um, thanks. And we're, we're doing an interview after this for my channel, and I'm going to ask you about your composition process. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's an idea of kind of having one melody flow into another, and having counter melodies. You know, I like I love counterpoint a lot. So having a bass line that goes this way and a melody that goes this way, and just finding ways to make that as catchy and musical as you can. Mm. Um, my mother's a very musical person, and she has a, a real ear for whistling. So she'll oh. just whistle all day and dry, honestly drive everyone crazy. <laughs> but I swear, for like thirty percent of her day is spent whistling. <laughs> wow. And she'll go for medleys from one song to another song. To you know, she'll be whistling piano man, then she'll be whistling, you know, um, singing in the rain, and then she'll be whistling blackbird and yesterday. And it's just like this constant medley of songs. And mm. and and like I love melodic music, and it's just a way of finding ways to express melodies on the instrument, mm. and as well as kind of you know show, showcasing, um, you know, the instrument a, a little bit. Because mm-hmm. I love the idea of pushing technique to to, to another level, and and I love the you, the way you incorporate, you know, different groove elements. I think that's really, mm-hmm. really, really cool, and and it's an exciting thing to, to have you know so many greats of fingerstyle guitar that we can, kind of learn from and grow from, and then take mm-hmm. it in a in a in a direction more influenced by. Well, that's you know, interesting. Different what you musical said genres. about kind of pushing an instrument to its limit, because I've noticed as well um, in your arrangements, be it uh, you know one of your own compositions or uh, um, someone else's song um, or a group song that you've arranged, in that you really do push the guitar. There's always something that kind of it's it's coming around the corner and you don't realize it's coming, but then bang, it hits you. You know, there's this like <laughs> harmonic riff or there's a reharmonization or there's you're kind of you make sure to get every kind of it's it's like wringing out the a wet towel, you know, you're really getting all the water out of that towel. Is that uh, I suppose is that a conscious choice that you do when you're arranging or is it more just kind of along the way you find something that works and if it happens to work, you you stick it in. Yeah, you know, I think it's like kind of beginning with the end in mind, as as they say. It's it's, mm. what would a great arrangement of this song look like, and how can I get to that place? What would make mm-hmm. it exciting, and kind of make people want to listen to it again and again? Yeah. And what would you know when you've had some experience performing, you kind of know what kind of energy connects with people, and and you're just chasing that feeling of having a song that really reacts. Because, you know, I remember being a teenager, and I'd play all these original songs, and people would be like, oh, yeah, it's great. And then I'd play classical gas, and they'd just go totally apeshit. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, man, how, do, how can I get something that good? And, and, mm. um, and, uh, and you know, we both have been influenced uh, by Kieran Murphy. I, I know that. Mm, and Kieran, uh, yeah. I remember when I first heard Kieran... Um, 
you know, he's a couple years older than me, and I'm a couple years older than you, I think. So <laughs> when, when, when I heard him, I was like, wow, that's so cool. It's someone who's, you know, about my age, who's playing, mm. you know, this cool music, and, and mm. I love the way he composed, composes. It's just like he ha, ha, has a real special uh, mm. way, way of doing that. So, it, you know, that, that, that was a, a, a big inspiration for me. And, mm. and, uh, and yeah, it's like uh, that's, that's kind of the whole point of, of um of being a creative musical person f- for for me although yeah, I know there's people that ju- they just arrange and I think that's um that's great as well but yeah mm. for me I I've just always been a appeal it's, the appeal of writing writing pieces has always has been there for me mm-hmm. um a, a question that I've I've been asking as well and um you know it, it's it's funny the the kind of the different approaches people take with this but all of us have things we want to get better at. All of us have things, you know, we need to spend more time, you know, on working on time or working on rhythm or working on composing, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Now, on today, on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, is there anything <laughs> that you find that still, in musical terms, is there anything you still find inaccessible or anything you still haven't gotten your head around as much as you'd like to yet? As in maybe a goal for the future might be to get your head around it. Do you have anything like that that you want to work on but you just haven't had the time to do yet? Well, honestly, I mean, t- t- to me, when I, I, I love to read and when I read like something really difficult, some philosophical idea like i'm reading schopenhauer now it's Mm. just like oh my goodness this is something that i don't understand anywhere near as much as i want to so it kind of Uh, opens up this huge well of possibility i mean in in terms of the things that i'm working on constantly and always battling you know time is definitely the the mm. main one that i'm always just trying to get better at and that's what I was practicing this this morning, as yeah. well as my harmonic understanding, you know, for some for some time I kind of resisted going deep into, you know, learning some of the more esoteric, uh, you know, like we talked about the melodic minor. I was kind of like, I don't want to get too jazzy, you know. It's like, it's okay. just, yeah. you know, so, someone in Nashville told me, oh, melodic minor is a great way to get fired from a gig <laughs> playing playing that on a bandstand <laughs> in, in in Nashville, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, and I've I've come to appreciate that yeah I mean there's a lot of information there that that I want to learn but in terms of things I'm really struggling with I mean for me it's just a, it's a challenge of trying to to write a better song you know I I want my next instrumental album that I'm working on to be really mm. really great I want to really dig deep so that's kind mm. of the real challenge is how great can I can I make it I think. You know, sometimes I'll see guitarists who are in the 16, 17, 18 year old range, and I'm like, "There's a magic about being that that age. Mm. There's there's something special there." And, and I wrote a lot of my instrumental songs that I still play that that that, that age. Mm-hmm. And Kieran Murphy wrote, you know, some great songs at that time. And mm. you know, like uh, Jackson Brown wrote "These Days" when he was 16. And yeah. um, you know, just there's something magic about you know being being that age. So. It's kind of like, um, yeah, just trying to to write better pieces, and and I really enjoy being a craftsman of of music. You know, mm. every day I'm just whittling away at it. It's not like I'm I'm uh, trying to. You know, I, I read this book lately, uh, recently called "So Good They Can't Ignore You" by Cal Newport, and the idea is like everyone says, "Oh, follow your passion, follow your passion." That's where you the happiness is and he's like well actually that's not really great advice it's because if you if you act like okay i want to do something i'm really passionate about so the the world will reward me with being able to to do that thing Mm -hmm. (laughs) like i want to bake that into my you know life and he said the way to you know from what he made a really compelling argument in this book that it's better to think of it as being a craftsman and just crafting something that's so valuable and so unique and so great and means so much to 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 some number mm. of people it can be a small number it can be a large number that's so great that you know people can't ignore it yeah and that and that gives people something it serves people so mm-hmm. that's really the, the the way i think about it is is just crafting music that's special because i think music's really important i think music's been really important you know in the irish tradition and Mm. and cultural tradition which i i have you know lineage from from that part of the world and i think uh 
yeah, I mean, I just really am grateful that that I was, um, you know, discontent enough as a young person to focus all my energy into figuring out this this uh, you know instrument. Yeah, and I think the world is a better place for it. Well, Joe, um, that was a, a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much for coming on the Fretboard Atlas. I am very keen to hear what you think after listening to all of uh, Joe's wisdom over the last couple of videos. If you have any comments or anything you want me to pass along to Joe, uh, please leave them on the channel and I will make sure to do that. And uh, it's just left for me to say, Joe Robinson, thank you so much for joining me. And I can't wait until this pandemic is over so we can see each other and play a couple of tunes together again. Likewise, Shane. Thanks so much, mate. Take care. Cheers, buddy.